I'm Mary Dare. I'm currently filling in for an AIDS while she's on long service leave at the um, Royal Women's Hospital GP Liaison Unit. I'm excited to have you joining us tonight for two important topics from two great speakers. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri and the Boon people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may be attending the event tonight also. Please um, keep yourselves on mute throughout the presentations and put any questions on the chat box. But they'll be answered at the end of each presentation. If there's any questions remaining, we can um, look at getting the answers to you at a later date. The presentations will be recorded and available also at a later date. So firstly, I'd like to welcome Orla McNally, who is going to present on ovarian cancer screening and will also be providing us with an overview of gynecological cancers. Orla is a subspecialist surgical gynecological oncologist and the director of oncology and the dysplasia unit at the Royal Women's Hospital, as well as the gynecological tumor stream lead for the Victorian Comprehensive Cancer Centre. Orla is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the University of Melbourne. As well as being the lead for the gynae oncology multidisciplinary team at the Royal Women's Hospital, Orla provides clinical support to the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre and Royal Melbourne Hospital. Originally from Ireland, Orla first trained in general surgery and was dismayed by the poor outcomes for women with ovarian cancer, so her career moved to gynaecological cancer. During her time working in the NHS and in the, last, in the United Kingdom in the last 12 years in Melbourne, Orla has led and taught multidisciplinary care in particular, offering women the opportunity to be involved in research, including clinical trials, from prevention through to end of life at any time in their cancer journey. To this end, Orla collaborates nationally through the ASGO, the ANZGOG and the CTA, and internationally through the IGCS, GCIG and ESGO. Thank you, Orla. Thanks, Mary, um, and I will share my screen um, and thank you to so many people for joining this evening it's actually lovely to um, well I can't see all of your faces but I certainly recognize quite a few of the names that um, have appeared on the list of attendees um, so initially I was tasked with talking about ovarian cancer screening and I could probably sum that up in one slide, but that would be a little bit disingenuous. So I'll go through the reasons why there currently actually isn't any place for ovarian cancer screening. But of course, just to set the scene, um, I'll go over a few other things first. So um, first of all, Ovarian cancer represents a significant burden of disease for women and their families around the world, with nearly a quarter of a million women diagnosed with um, ovarian cancer. And this is a statistic that is set to rise by up to 55% by the year 2037. The situation in Australia is also significant as we in just 2020 had over 1500 women diagnosed with ovarian cancer and uh, although this represents just over two percent of women with cancer um, of, of women diagnosed with of the cancer diagnosis um, it actually constitutes a significant cause of, of death with over a thousand females dying from this cancer in uh, 2020. The chance of surviving this cancer still however remains poor and I certainly uh, know previously in talks I used to estimate this at five years of being about um, a one in four chance although we can probably say overall that it is greater than that but when you look at the survival for stage it is still significantly poor particularly for um, advanced stage. And I think particularly relevant to uh, a country like Australia, um, this survival doesn't really seem to differ whether you are treated in a major city or in a regional centre that we know of at the moment. So this is pretty much my only overview of tumours of the ovary that I have in this talk because 
we're realizing that this is a much more complex disease and um, the ovary, however, can be a source of a number of uh, tumors, which I've summarized in this slide here. And indeed, the most common reason for a woman to be admitted to surgery to hospital in her lifetime is with a uh, low ovarian cyst. But of course, not all of these cysts are going to turn out to be anything more serious. Uh, essentially, the breakdown of our tumors is into those arising from the surface epithelium and those arising from the, the stroma. And we do have this peculiar um, group within the epithelial group, which is this borderline tumor, which I like to explain this to women that this is when you look down the microscope, it has some features suggestive of cancer, but actually not enough to call it a true cancer. And the treatment is surgery, and these women uh, don't require any chemotherapy. But the focus of uh, my talk this evening is really going to be on our more common and deadlier form of ovarian cancer, and that is the cancer that arises from the epithelium of the ovary. And um, this constitutes the majority of ovarian cancers. And within that subgroup, um, most of these fall into this, the serious type of ovarian cancer, which uh, has the most significant outcome in terms of, of um, poor outcome. And essentially, uh, a lot of this is related to the fact that these cancers spread interperitoneally and uh, rarely through lymphatics or by blood, which already alludes to the fact that it is very difficult to uh, screen for this disease. So thinking again about uh, the stage and bearing in mind um, these statistics, so if we had this cancer diagnosed at an early age, then the fiber survival is, is very good. So it is up there with um, uh, many other uh, cancers, and this is where it is confined to one of both ovaries. Stage two, where uh, it has left the ovaries and into local areas in the pelvis. Stage three, where it has gone beyond uh, that and into the omentum. And stage four, where it's gone into the solid organs, such as the liver and the lung. And unfortunately, the majority of women still are diagnosed at uh, stage three or stage four. So just to give an outline of my talk, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk quite a bit about the uh, UK collaborative trial of ovarian cancer screening. Uh, I'm going to talk about CA125, some future directions, and what can we be thinking about doing in the meantime to reduce risk of ovarian cancer for women. I said before that I could probably sum up my talk in one line and by the end of um, my next few slides, you hopefully are going to agree with me that currently we have no effective screening tests for ovarian cancer, even for women with um, high risk disease or, or, or who are at high risk of developing cancer. To date, most of these the trials and research have looked at a combination of the tumor marker CA125 and the use of transvaginal ultrasound. But this uh, really now has been cemented in the final publication from the UK Collaborative on the Trial of Ovarian Cancer Screening. And this was published in The Lancet in June of this year. And while the chief investigator over the years, Professor Ian Jacobs, was quite um, sad at the conclusion of this. I think it is fair to say that it's been um, important to have gone through this process and to show through rigorous research that uh, ultrasound and CA125 in whatever combination really does not uh, translate into uh, a useful screening test. So let's just look at this uh, in a bit more detail. So it was a randomized controlled trial of postmenopausal women between the age of 50 and 74, 13 centers across the NHS um, recruited women between 2001 and 2015. Women were excluded if they had had uh, a bilateral oophorectomy, if they had a previous ovarian malignancy, or they had a previous or active non-ovarian malignancy. Women who had an increased familial cancer risk were also excluded. And the trial randomized women 
in blocks of 32 to either multimodal screening, which I'll explain in a minute, annual transvaginal ultrasound screening or no screening um, at all. And this was a one to one to two ratio. The follow-up was uh, through um, the national registries and um, this was over a 14 year period. The primary outcome and the most important outcome of this was to see if this was going to reduce the number of deaths from uh, ovarian or tubal cancer. And um, ovarian cancer included both epithelium and non epithelia as well as borderline tumors, although there was a sub analysis done for the invasive cancers. The secondary outcome was looking at the incidence of the cancers in the different groups, as well as the uh, stage. So this is just a schema of um, the actual population. And you can see that at the beginning, over a million women were um, uh, seemed to be eligible, and ultimately over 200,000 were randomized. The compliance in the screened group was excellent uh, for both the ultrasound only and the multi-modal uh, tool. So um, ultimately over um, this period of time, there was a final cohort of analysis, which was distributed well across the groups. When you think of the one to one to two uh, ratio, the baseline characteristics were balanced between the uh, groups and the number of screens was over 600,000 with a median of eight annual screens for each woman. So the methods of screening used, the multimodal screening, so this refers to the use of a transvaginal ultrasound as well as a serial CA125 measurements. So using um, the risk of uh, cancer calculation previously described by the authors where a where you don't just take a single CA125 concentration, but you look at um, how this changes over time for an individual uh, woman, um, and that gives a risk calculation. And I thought that was actually a very um, attractive thing to do because when we treat women with ovarian cancer and they normalize their CA125, um, I've certainly noticed over the years that for each woman, their nadir or their normal level is, is often quite different. So one woman, it might be 25, another woman, it might be 12. And uh, so even when you have changes in and around those concentrations after cancer treatment, it might um, be a sign that there's an, an early recurrence. But we're talking about screening here. Um, and um, we'll, we'll see that actually, even then it's not as good. So if the screen was uh, normal, initially they had an annual screen. If it was intermediate, they had a repeat test in three months and if it was elevated, they went on to have a transvaginal ultrasound as a second line test um, and then referred on if there was an issue. In the ultrasound only group, an annual transvaginal scan and uh, again, broken down into annual screening if normal, unsatisfactory, would have a repeat scan in three months or if the scan was abnormal, a repeat scan with a senior ultrasonographer within six weeks, and uh, patients with persistent abnormalities were assessed and referred on for further investigation or surgery, depending on the uh, findings. Women who had surgery or biopsy for suspected ovarian cancer after a clinical assessment were deemed uh, screen positive. So the cases of cancer detected in all groups and the number of cases at early stage was as probably expected higher than in the no screening group as, as outlined by this uh, figure here. In the uh, multimodal screening group, the number of advanced cases, so stage three and four was less than in the no screened group. And the um, changes, however, in this stage migration did not change the number of, of deaths. And ultimately, um, that would be obviously an important thing if you were to 
detect something earlier, is that going to translate into um, reduced number of deaths, which didn't turn out to be the case. That it, this is illustrated in, in this figure here. So initially, and remembering again, this is a one to one to two ratio. So the figures are pretty much the same in each of the groups. And um, so a p-value, which was not statistically significant. And this is uh, reflected in the Catherine Meyer um, survival plots over the years, uh, with the cumulative death rate was the same in the uh, screened and the unscreened group. And when it was broken down into invasive epithelial cancers, the effect uh, was even less. So what we conclude about this very important trial is that it was um, the largest ovarian cancer screening trial to date. The long-term follow-up was uh, a median of 16 years. Neither multimodal screening or ultrasound significantly reduced deaths from either ovarian or tubal cancer. There was uh, a certain degree of stage migration, um, particularly in the multimodal screen group, but this did not translate into a reduction in mortality. And so um, the uh, conclusion is that for a general population screening, this cannot be used as a uh, screening tool. So what about uh, women who are high risk for developing ovarian or tubal cancer? And um, these are really women who are identified as having a genetic mutation. The most common ones being the BRCA gene mutation, where for BRCA1, the risk of ovarian cancer over lifetime is 44%. BRCA2, a bit less, but still a significant 17%. With uh, the Lynch uh, syndrome genes, uh, mismatch repair gene mutations, there is significant risk associated with the different genes and uh, an increasing number of other genes that have now been shown to be significant in terms of uh, pathogenic mutations, um, which are also um, showing up on our, our uh, genetic uh, screens. Uh, this does not preclude women who have a significant family history um, where no particular gene mutation has been uh, discovered as yet, but uh, of course may in the future. So um, as part of the UK uh, TOX studies, there was a um, study that did look at high-risk women and it did use the multimodal screening every three to four months. But what compounded this was that a number of women actually underwent risk reduction surgery during this time. So they had actually had their tubes and ovaries removed. And it's also accepted that um, there are biological differences between women who have uh, cancers uh, as a result of the BRCA mutation. And also that any cancers that do arise are likely to be impacted by the treatment that they receive and the different types of treatment that might be available uh, to them. For example, the um, uh, more recent introduction of PARP inhibitors. So the conclusion from this for the high-risk women then is that it's unlikely that the true effect of screening on mortality could ever be assessed in this population as a randomized controlled trial would be challenging and there are potentially very effective preventive measures such as risk-reducing salpingectomy with delayed oophorectomy uh, as, as something that should be evaluated going forward. The other large screening trial that uh, included uh, ovarian screening was the PLCO a study from America, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This was again a large randomized controlled trial and again, did not show any reduction in ovarian cancer deaths between the screened and the unscreened populations with a median follow-up of 12 to 14 years. Um, and again, found no evidence of stage distribution. So why, why doesn't... Um, it work, and I will just go through this under the, the following headings if we consider what 
the criteria for a successful screening program. Uh, why CA125 is not a great? Um, do ovarian cancers actually arise from the ovaries? And um, uh, interventions for any uh, reduced incidence of cancer, the morbidity and in particular the mortality as a result of false, positive, false positives must be taken into consideration. And certainly early on in the UK trial of cancer screening, a number of women were subjected to interventions um, such as laparoscopy um, because of false positives. And even in the most recent study, one in four women were laparoscoped to find one cancer. So just to remind us of the principles of screening as outlined by Wilson and uh, Junger in 1968. And, and really, I don't need to go through these to uh, uh, tell you that um, we are nowhere near um, using this as a form of screening for women in our, our um, in relation to ovarian cancer. So what about CA125? Well, we know it is elevated in 80% of advanced epithelial ovarian cancers. However, um, it's not always elevated in uh, some cancers and indeed in early disease, it's not increased in about half of the cancers. Um, there is a variation in the level between patients as well as between pathology labs, and it has a very poor specificity, especially in premenopausal women. It is um, so nonspecific, really, that it is elevated in a number of other cancers, particularly metastatic cancer, and um, sorry, and it is also elevated in a number of benign conditions. So things such as endometriosis, pelvic inflammatory disease, fibroids, um, and uh, then other systemic conditions such as liver disease, pleural and pericardial um, effusions. Um, HE4 is a human epididymis marker 4, which has been um, used and does increase the sensitivity to detect cancer somewhat, but really um, only slightly more than CA125, and again, has a number of false positives. So uh, to my mind, CA, the use of CA125 is really the triaging of women with pelvic pathology, particularly ovarian masses, uh, alongside uh, imaging, and then um, making the appropriate referral to a gynecologist or a specialist gyne oncologist. The second usefulness is the response to treatment. And uh, thirdly, uh, follow up after a treatment, um, which is also a little bit controversial because in fact, even after cancer treatment, if you treat women based on a rising CA125 alone, as opposed to waiting for rising CA125 and symptoms to arise, there's actually no difference in their overall survival. However, increasingly, CA125 level is used as an entry criteria for uh, clinical trials. And so um, it is important that we have this as, as part of um, a clinical follow-up so, so that women can benefit from entry into appropriate trials going forward. Um, so, the other tumor markers that are sometimes used, uh, CA99, I would, I would say that this is a particularly useless marker. It doesn't take much for it to be elevated. Um, and in some even benign conditions can be very elevated and produce a lot of anxiety. Uh, we tend to, once a woman is referred with a suspected ovarian cancer, also check their CEA because if this is higher, in terms of ratio to CA125, it could be that they have a bowel primary rather than ovarian primary. The other useful marker sometimes is CA153. But again, uh, these are markers that should be considered once a woman is, has been referred. For younger women, particularly um, uh, so premenopausal women, we think about what we refer to as the juvenile tumor markers because they are more likely to have a non-epithelial uh, cancer and, and they fall into this group here. 
but always bearing in mind all of these have limited sensitivity and specificity, which is why in terms of uh, screening program, uh, CA125 remains um, really quite useless. So it now um, it makes a lot of sense uh, that not only in terms of um, women presenting quite late with disease and I often think, you know, why don't we think about this before? But there has been this increasing evidence to support um, the tubal origin of ovarian cancer. Um, and I would just emphasize again that I'm referring really to high grade serous cancer, which is our most common ovarian cancer that we treat and does have the um, poor outcomes. Um, and this started to gain traction when women were undergoing risk reduction surgery. So they were having their fallopian tubes and ovaries removed. And uh, they were found to have not only uh, sticks, which are the serous tubal interepithelial cancer lesions, where there is cytological atypia and abnormal expression of P53, and the greater than 10% key 67, which is usually a, a marker of um, uh, ag aggressive malignancy but also um, identifying other lesions called secretory cell outgrowths or, or scouts, and uh, even before that tubal intraepithelial lesions in transition. And what is probably even more sobering about all of these is that um, more recently, these have been discovered to sit within the peritoneal cavity. Um, so long before, uh, any of the epithelium can go onto the surface of the ovary, um, it is possible that some of these abnormal cells are actually leaking out into the peritoneum and um, uh, depositing on peritoneal surfaces and, and being malignant, um, mal potentially malignant. Um, and this is where we remind ourselves that um, the, the unique, one of the unique differences between men and women is that women are internally connected to the external environment as a result of the fallopian tubes because the fallopian tubes are actually interperitoneal. They connect with the uterus and the cervix uh, to the vagina. So they, um, there is a direct external to internal connection. Um, this theory was developed a bit more by uh, Ronnie Drapkin, and um, he used a mouse model where uh, all of these, the, the, the mice had been bred to have a BRCA mutation. Um, and in one group, there was no surgery. So all of these uh, mice went on to develop cancer. In another mouse, the, only the ovaries were removed and somewhat to their surprise, quite a lot of mice had developed um, cancer, but when the tubes were removed, this was much less so. Um, and not to confuse the issue too much, but within um, even high-grade serous cancer, we now know that this is more like a a basket of fruit rather than just a one group of cells because we uh, know that there are significant subtypes even with our, in our serious, serious cancer. So a very complex um, condition indeed. So are there any um, ongoing studies looking at screening for ovarian cancer? Um, and I think one of the conclusions from the uh, trial of ovarian cancer screening from the UK is that all of these are probably a decade away, but um, the research groups are really looking at things like liquid biopsies, which include tests from the serum, uterine lavage, urine samples, circulating tumor cells, circulating free DNA, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would caution that we do have uh, some people in our community who are testing for 
circulating tumor cells and I do get the odd phone call saying I need to see this woman straight away because she's um, got ovarian cancer because she has shown this in her circulating uh, tumor cells and um, none of this is proven outside of uh, any research at the moment. So it is very anxiety provoking for women and again, potentially subjects them to um, morbidity from further interventions. So in the meantime, what can we do to try and reduce the uh, risk of women developing ovarian cancer um, and tubal cancer? And I, I use those synonymously and indeed, um, primary peritoneal, and I think it will be clear maybe from what I've talked about so far, is that uh, we think about these three conditions uh, under the same heading now. They present the same way, they're treated the same way, uh, down the microscope they look the same way. So um, it seemed uh, like the incidence of ovarian cancer was beginning to fall, and this has been put down to the use of the oral contraceptive pill. And in fact, um, it is thought that uh, uh, with five years of use, that the risk over a lifetime is, is reduced by about two thirds. Um, over many years, it has been shown that women who have had any type of gynecological surgery, um, be it a tubal ligation or a hysterectomy, that their risk of ovarian cancer is reduced, even if the ovaries are left in situ, suggesting that that interruption to the tubal pathway um, has a significance. Salpingectomy, um, particularly if we think that some of these cancers have their origin in the fallopian tubes, and so much so that uh, Ranscog um, recommends that if women are having surgery for any uh, gynecological surgery for any reason, and they are finished their fertility, then uh, the tube should be removed the ovaries uh, left until the age of 60, because we now know the importance of the ovaries in terms of cognitive function, even after the menopause. Salpingo oophorectomy is going to be more appropriate for some women, and I will talk about that a bit. And um, obviously, really importantly, identification of at-risk women. And um, to try and increase our knowledge around this area, uh, recruitment to any clinical trial going forward. Um, so this is a, a table taken from one of our gynecology tumor stream reports. Um, these figures just go up to 2017, but you can see that the number of referrals for risk reduction surgery has increased significantly over, over this time. It is sitting um, just over 100 now, and the figure at the bottom here um, showing the number for 2018-19. We do find cancers in these women, and thankfully it is small, um, but this may actually, um, there are factors which will cause this to increase, not least not being able to do the surgery at the appropriate um, age. And, um, uh, and this, this is something that we are grappling with at the moment, because because of the impact of the pandemic and COVID on our waiting times for surgery. So um, the guidance on um, who should we be uh, testing? Well, it is now routine for us to test any woman who has been diagnosed with um, an invasive epithelial ovarian cancer. So if they're over the age of 60, this is um, bracket testing and we can do this uh, at the time of diagnosis without needing to refer patients to the familial cancer clinic, although if they have a positive test, they will be followed up by the familial cancer clinic. Um, if women are under the age of 60, there is a more expanded panel, um, but uh, none of this um, trumps a strong family history. And indeed, if uh, a relative has had um, a cancer but has is since deceased and has not been tested um, through the Australian ovarian cancer study, it is possible for many women uh, to obtain information about this cancer in their family through the traceback study through Peter McCallum. 
Patients who do not meet the criteria or wish to self-fund genetic testing can be referred to the familial cancer clinic for, for risk assessment and genetic testing. And if um, you need to find any uh, information on this, then it is available through EverQ. And in fact, I often bring this up in, uh, in consultations with patients as um, the guidelines um, the evidence for this continues to evolve. Um, the discovery of new genetic mutations continues to occur. So this, this information uh, needs to be updated and um, referred to when we're counseling patients. Um, so now that we are seeing many women for risk reduction surgery, I thought I would go through what this deals with and um, David, who is talking next, is, is the lead for our cancer prevention within our gynae oncology unit. Um, and he also has a sessional commitment with the Familial Cancer Clinic, uh, which allows fantastic uh, crossover between um, the, the care of women who are at high risk of disease and those who actually have uh, disease. Um, most of our referrals do come from the familial cancer clinic or from high-risk clinics such as um, the breast clinic, although we will have some general practice referrals, but when we triage these, we may recommend that they go to familial cancer clinic first for appropriate uh, history um, accumulation. Um, during the consultation, we um, go take a full gynecological history and then go through the surgical technique using uh, diagrams. The surgery for most women is by the laparoscopic route and uh, we discuss whether uh, there is a need for hysterectomy or not. Um, it is important that we, because this is risk reduction, that uh, we advise women that the risk does not um, fall by 100%, it's thought actually to be somewhere around 90%, and the residual risk is thought to be primary peritoneal cancer, which we cannot uh, mitigate, so women are reminded that they should remain uh, symptom aware even after risk reduction surgery. There is a risk of prevalent disease at the time of surgery, and as I mentioned, this does tend to go up with age, but if women are having their surgery at the appropriate age, then this should be less than 1%. Um, and this is also why it is important that women are looked after within the realms of a gynae cancer service, so that whoever is doing surgery has access to, for example, frozen section if cancer is suspected, and access to gynae oncological surgery to um, perform the appropriate surgery. Access to specialist pathology is also important because the, the fallopian tubes in particular are um, examined with a particular protocol which cuts through the fimbria um, at more intervals than with routine pathology. Many women will be advised that they should just have everything removed, but in fact for um, the BRCA mutations in particular, um, although there is a suggestion that maybe in BRCA1 there might be a higher incidence of endometrial cancer. It's not enough yet to recommend pelvic clearance for these women. And really, the addition of a hysterectomy should um, be informed by other gynecological issues. Um, the plan for hormone replacement therapy, for example, um, will a myrena and transdermal estrogen be an option? or uh, is myrena not an option, in which case um, estrogen only and uh, removing the uterus for that reason might be appropriate. There's always a risk of conversion to open surgery um, and um, this needs to be taken into consideration as well. So uh, if women are referred before the recommended age, and this is not uncommon for a discussion, then um, uh, we recommend that they are referred back 12 months before reaching the optimal age for risk reduction surgery. And we discuss the fact that there is no role for screening and that it is not appropriate to have ultrasounds or CO125 testing uh, during that time. 
um, women who have complete families can be offered an interim risk reduction self injectomy. Um, but being counseled that there is only indirect evidence for the effectiveness of this um, as yet. Um, it's in, very important that we go through the impact of menopause and refer to the menopause clinic if um, appropriate. Um, and as I have uh, just alluded to, most of these women are listed as category two, unless they are significantly older. Um, and, and in which case we might try to make them category one emerging category. Um, and it's important that uh, we do continue to look into this risk and ways of reducing it. So there are a number of uh, studies ongoing uh, that have started in the space and future ones uh, coming along. So uh, one is the sticks and stone study, which is um, led by um, Professor Kelly Phillips at uh, Peter Mac. And this is women planning risk reduction surgery uh, who take um, our, uh, aspirin for six months prior to the surgery and the investigation will look to see if this reduces the lesions in the in the tubes. Um, there are a number of surgical menopause studies um, in, including one from Monash looking at the cognitive impact um, comparing cognition um, prior to and after risk reduction surgery and um, in the development right now is the tubal whips study which will be looking at uh, salpingectomy with um, delayed uh, oophorectomy which David is involved in. So um, just my final couple of slides are really just a reminder um, about the optimal care pathway for ovarian cancer. Um, the, I led the working group for this through the Cancer Council of Victoria. Um, and I, I think it is a good overview of the, of the management um, and the workup of women um, where ovarian cancer is suspected. We always wonder what symptoms we should look out for. And of course, it's very sobering that even the most common symptom, which is um, abdominal bloating, um, usually means that women already have advanced disease. I think what is probably most telling is that these women tend to describe a persistent bloating rather than the fluctuating bloating that comes with other um, conditions such as irritable bowel syndrome. And uh, we do have evidence that most of these women have attended uh, their GPs on a number of occasions prior to being uh, referred to um, a specialist. Um, and uh, again, this is the assessment of these uh, suspicious uh, symptoms with a prompt for ultrasound um, and CT at the time of referral. Um, so uh, thank you for listening. I'm sure there'll be uh, some questions at the end um, just to remind you of um, the Gynae Onc uh, team. So uh, myself, Deborah Nisham, our latest uh, Gynae Oncologist to join the team is uh, Antonia Jones. And uh, as I said, David, who's going to speak next, leads our display service and uh, cancer prevention. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Orla. That was great. <laughs> Um, all right, wonderful. Well, if there's no questions, then I think we'll move on to David's presentation. Um, so David is going to be presenting for us uh, in the updates of referral criteria for colposcopy and surgical screening. So David Reddy is the, currently the consultant gynaecologist and lead for dysplasia clinic at the Royal Women's Hospital. He's also an honorary senior lecturer at the Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology at the University of Melbourne and honorary consultant to the familial cancer clinic at the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Born in London, he trained in medicine at Cambridge University and St. Thomas's Hospital, and subsequently in general surgery and obstetrics and gynaecology in London, Oxford and Birmingham, with a period of research at the Ludwig Institute in London, where he investigated the role of HPV in cervical cancer. 
David was previously a consultant in O&D with a special interest in oncology for the NHS Fire Scotland and subsequently in Taunton, Somerset, England before immigrating to Australia over 10 years ago with his wife, Orla McNally, who is Director of Gynecological Cancer at the Women's and the BCC Gynecological Tumor Stream. David's interests include gynecological cancer prevention, including colposcopy and risk reduction in familiar cancer syndromes, such as BRCA1 and 2 and Lynch syndrome, HPV biology and vaccines, advanced laparoscopic and complex benign gynecological surgery, the creation of usable, interoperable and flexible clinical IT systems. He's also a member of the board of the Victorian Cytology Service past Secretary of the Committee of Management of the Australian Society for Colposcopy and Cervical Pathology, and a member of the Medical and Scientific Committee of the Cancer Council of Victoria. He's actively involved in the renewal of Australia's Cervical Cancer Screening Program as a member of the Victorian Renewal Advisory Committee and Associate Investigator on the COMPASS trial and to the NHMRC Centre for the Control of Cervical Cancer. He was previously on the Federal Working Party that authored the new clinical management guidelines for the renewed program that were implemented on the 1st of December 2017 and is currently a member of the expert clinic panel reviewing the cervical cancer screening program for the Department of Health. Thank you, David, for your presentation today. Thank you so much, Mary, and thank you everyone for joining us this evening <clears throat> for these two talks, which I think a very relevant uh, updates on things that are moving these days extremely fast. Um, as Orla has said, uh, my main interest is now centered on cancer prevention rather than cancer treatment. And it's been a great privilege to be involved in uh, much of the work that sees Australia uh, leading the way in the elimination of cervix cancer. Now we've got to find the right slides my usual problem david i have a copy if you need me to share my no, I, I, um, I had them up front so I, this, this should be very obvious but i should have perhaps practiced this here we go <clears throat> So we're going to look today at the renewed cervical uh, cancer screening program, but also a little bit about what's happening across the globe and uh, a peek into the future of, of the prevention of cervix cancer and perhaps even eventually its elimination. Um, I have a number of declarations of interest, some of which you've already heard about. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about HPV and cervical cancer in Australia, a bit about what went on before 2017 challenges uh, to pap smear screening and why it was necessary to move to a new paradigm and then uh, what was projected and what actually happened and the challenges that that presented and then some of the issues that the changes of the last three and a half years has given us and then future strategies both for Australia but also more widely. So many of you will know HPV is the virus that causes more than 90% of cervix cancer worldwide, both squamous and adenocarcinomas. <clears throat> it's a very common infection in human beings. There are more than 60 genital types, the vast majority of which lead to self-limiting infections, and only a minority of types are associated with cancer. 6 and 11 are the cause of 90% of genital warts, and there are 14 or 15 oncogenic, potentially oncogenic types that cause this 90% of cervix cancer recognizing that a small amount of cervical cancer is not caused by HPV and has never been preventable by screening, uh, regardless of the test that was used. <clears throat> Across the globe, HPV 16 and 18 are the most oncogenic viruses and cause 70% of cervix cancer. HPV is transmitted through sexual activity. Uh, infections are very common and mostly self-limiting. Before vaccination occurred, 80% um, of sexually active 30 year olds would have had an HPV infection and 90 to 95 percent of them would never have known it. 10 percent of persistent infections with oncogenic types can develop what we call high-grade dysplasia or CIN 2 and 3 and over those one percent per annum will progress to invasive disease. It is estimated that not more than 40 percent 
of SYN23 progresses to cancer, but as we have no triage of, um, for whom will resolve this or whom will uh, pro progress, we treat all of it. A study performed across Victoria uh, involving the Royal Women's Hospital tried to understand the type distribution of uh, HPV in different cancers, cervical cancers, and we looked at over 850 cancers <clears throat> and found a pattern that was very consistent with 16 and 18, very close to 70%. And then we found the next um, uh, five types, which are in fact the five types um, now covered by the Gardasil 9 vaccine. You can see that individually they contribute much less to the burden of disease, but they are associated with invasive cancers. If you look at a uh, a relative risk of progression to cancer, um, a study undertaken uh, uh, 10 years ago, uh, came up with odds ratios for the different types and their ability to develop invasive disease. And you can see here that um, 16 and 18 are right up there. 16 stands out on its own as the most oncogenic HPV type responsible for 50% of cervix cancer around the world. Uh, 18 is next. And there are a variety of other types that may um, uh, contribute more than we think, more than we have previously acknowledged, uh, 33 and 45. 45 is a cousin of 18. For Australia, uh, here is the historical age standardised incidence mortality rates for cervix cancer um, all, of all uh, <clears throat> histological types um, from 82 to 2019. You can see that there was a beginning in a fall of the incidence with opportunistic screening. And then we introduced um, routine national screening in 1991. Not surprisingly, there was a small peak, which was, is what happens when you introduce a screening test, and then a really quite rapid and sustained fall, which had already plateaued by about 2005. Forgive me, my computer is slightly oversensitive. <clears throat> uh, We've seen no reduction in incidence um, of cervix cancer in Australia for the last uh, uh, 15 years, though we have seen a slow but steady fall in mortality associated with improved treatment, particularly of high stage disease and the onset of chemo radiation. Australia was one of the first countries to introduce, it did so with a catch-up program that was unique um, for women between the ages of 19 and 26. This continued for two years and consequently, all women who are now approaching the age of 40 were offered vaccination with Gardasil 4. In 2013, it was routinely, um, in, boys were routinely included in vaccination um, with a catch-up program being added on um, for, for uh, school, boys school age 12 to 15. In 2017, it was the catch-up program was extended to the age of 19 years. And this was really to allow some individuals who had been excluded from vaccination by parental um, prerogative from making their own choices about which, whether they wish to be vaccinated. In 2018, we moved to the two dose course with the nine valent vaccine. Work by Susan Garland at the Women's uh, and others have shown how effective these vaccines are. Our first indication was actually a study from the Melbourne Sexual Health Unit by Kit Fairley showing that um, uh, genital warts <clears throat> in uh, women who have sex with men and men who have sex with women collapsed in the first uh, nine to 12 months after the introduction of the vaccine, which was an extraordinary um, benefit that has that also has enormous e economic impact that perhaps has not been lauded as much as it might be. When you look across HPV types post-vaccination, you can see falls in any HPV types, but really it's the graph on the far right that shows you that the uh, genotypes that were targeted by vaccination collapsed after the introduction of Gardasil 4. Julia Brotherton, um, from VCS Population Health was the first person to demonstrate a fall in high-grade cervical disease. 
because Australia had traditionally offered pap tests to women before the age of 18, we were able to see this fall um, it actually during uh, occurring in the under 20s during the original outlay of the Gardasil 4 vaccine between 2007 2009. Subsequently, we've seen falls in high grade cervical pre cancer disease in the 20 to 24 year olds and the 20 to 25. And I can tell you, if you extend this graph now another five years, we're seeing falls in this, uh, the incidence of CIN 2 to 3. Um, in the 30 year old and 30, 30 to 35 year old group. Cervical cancer screening up until the end of 2017 was offered to any woman who had penetrative intercourse and should start between ages 18 and 20 or two years after coitarchy, whichever was later. The screening interval was set at 24 months and it ceased at 70. There was a definition of immunosuppressed women um, who might receive their test more frequently and it was basically limited to those who'd had transplantation or those who had an abnormal CD4 count and were HIV positive. There were a number of problems with the old screening program. Despite uh, the worldwide success and utility of the PAP test, it actually is a very insensitive test. With a single test on women with high grade uh, cells picking up only 70 out of 100 women. The reason it worked because it was done so frequently and the progression from a dysplasia to cancer is slow. There was also a drop off of engagement with cervical screening programs across the English speaking world, especially with young women. The success of the vaccination program would also mean there was significantly less HPV 16 and 18 disease in the population. And the, therefore the proportion of cytology detected high grade abnormalities would decrease and become more difficult for screeners and cytologists to pick. And colposcopic performance has been fairly standardized, but has not improved. We know that colposcopy is aided by what we're told the cytologist sees in the referral test. And colpos colposcopic performance in an HPV vaccinated po population was not even studied, let alone confirmed. High grade disease is more detected when referral cytology is known to be possible high grade or more and we know that the number of these reports was falling. So we needed new strategies uh, to deal with these realities and also perhaps to get a, a handle on adenocarcinoma. The recognized precursor for adenocarcinoma um, known as CGIN in the Northern Hemisphere or AIS in uh, Australia um, has always had a very poor sensitivity in relation to the PAP test. And we've never seen a reduction in incidence of adenocarcinoma over the period of national screening. What was then done was to question how we should renew the cervical screening program. And a number of different um, modalities were looked at, um, six of which are mentioned here. So we have conventional cytology, we have manually read um, liquid based cytology, possibly using HPV test as a triage. We have image read, that is automated reading of liquid based cytology, possibly using HPV as triage. We had HPV primary testing with liquid based cytology as a triage, or we had HPV with partial genotyping and referring HPV 16 and 18 directly to colposcopy. And we also looked at co-testing, that is where every screening test has both an HPV test and a cytology done at different intervals. In fact, there were 32 different algorithms that were modeled on this regard. And in the end, the one that was most effective and most cost effective um, was accepted by the Medical Standing Advisory Committee in 2014. And so we ended up with a new cervical screening test. It's an HPV test for 14 oncogenic types, which selects for types 16 and 18. Any positivity with HPV results in a reflex cytology test. The interval was five years, starting at 25 years of age, exiting at 70 to 74. All sexually active women would be included, whether vaccinated or not. And self-collection would be offered to women who had never screened or were underscreened. And this was for women who um, found it difficult to engage with the screening program or were hesitant to have a speculum and a practitioner collected sample who could insert a, a swab into the vagina and see if uh, one of the oncogenic HPVs could be detected. There would be a new national cancer screening register merging all the state registers. And instead of 
reminders when screening had been missed. There would be invitations in advance of the screening interval. It was anticipated that these changes would save at least uh, 200 invasive cancers per year. You know this algorithm, this is what it originally looked like. No HPV come back in five years. Any HPV 16 and 18 cytology go to colposcopy. And those in the uh, dozen or so non-16, 18 HPV positives were divided into groups. If it was negative or low grade, you got another test. If it was possible high grade or high grade, you went immediately to cytology. Any repeat HPV in this group at 12 months was referred to cytology. If the HPV had become negative in that 12 months, they would return to a five yearly screening. And there were blue lines there for repeating unsatisfactory tests. The sampling device has changed away from spatulas and there are the cervix brooms on the left here, which you'll be very familiar with. I must say, I find the uh, one with the spike, which is meant to collect endocervical cells really quite traumatic. And it's my personal preference to use a broom with the endocervical brush to get the maximum number of uh, cytologies that contain both squamous and endocervical cells. You know what a liquid-based test is like, directly targeted cervical uh, samples. So for the woman, the experience is no different from a pap test. The broom is rotated clockwise, add an endo brush. These are mashed and rinsed in the fluid, which is closed accurately. It's very important to align the markers on the jars of these fluid containers, otherwise the robot struggles to open them. And you need a special request form and you need to be very clear about what you're asking for. Is it a cervical screening test for someone who is asymptomatic within the target age group? Is it cytology only, which is mostly done at colposcopy? Or does the woman have symptoms, particularly postcoital or postmenopausal bleeding, in which case a co-test can be asked for as an investigation and it's not a screening test? I know there's been some problems with uh, these vials. Um, I think VCS is now providing double bagging with an absorbable containment so that the uh, spillage of the fluid is less of a problem. Um, uh, and I know Hologic have tried to deal with some of those issues. Um, just to be fair, this is a, a detailed a diagram of what to do, which you'll have seen before from one of VCS's competitors, but it contains all the essential elements. And it too makes the point that using a broom and a brush is the best way to obtain a satisfactory specimen with both cell types. Lubricants. Be very careful with lubricants. If they get into liquid-based samples, they can uh, uh, nullify the test. Um, if you're going to use lubricants, water is preferred. If you find you need more than that, then apply a water-based lubricant away from the tip of the speculum. Bringing in a new cervical test required entirely new guidelines. These were considered and completed in 2016 um, and now exist on a wiki hosted by the Cancer Council Australia. The benefit of this is they do not need to be systematically re rewritten every decade, but they can be update, updated piecemeal as new evidence uh, comes to affect any one part of the screening program. It contained for the first time full use of terminology from the International Federation for Cervical Pathology and Colposcopy and a full chapter on colposcopy itself and the treatment of abnormalities, as well as the, the management of screen detected um, uh, abnormal tests. It contains an enormous amount of useful information, a great summary on cervical cancer in Australia and the rationale for why we are one of the two countries in the world that have led with primary HPV screening. So uh, just a few tips, I think, for primary care. Much of this may be already well known to you. Um, I, I do get women occasionally coming into our clinics who are very frightened that they have cancer. I always feel it's important to emphasize that a positive test with HPV um, is, is a marker of risk for an abnormality. And that abnormality is on the vast majority of cases precancerous, not cancerous. And the five yearly negative cervical screening test to detect HPV is actually twice as safe as a two yearly negative pap smear. That is, you, you, you could actually extend the interval of HPV screening uh, to eight to nine years, and it would have the same performance um, uh, as, as a two yearly pap test. By the way, the under 25s, if this ever comes up, some under 25s 
who reveal either symptoms, in which case they're eligible for an investigative co-test, or um, who are revealed to you or someone else that they have uh, been abused sexually as children or had unwanted uh, adolescent sexual activity can get a screening test be before the age of 25. But the age of 25 was selected for screening because in more than 20 years of screening for cervical cancer, we had never reduced the incidence of cervix cancer in this age group, which is of itself incredibly low, between five and 15 cases uh, per annum in the whole of Australia. Vaccination will be much more effective at reducing uh, cervical cancer in this great age group than screening ever was. Also, overtreatment leads to generational risks of miscarriage, prematurity and neonatal death, something that we've now seen in repeated um, uh, analyses across the world of the impact of particularly cervical excisions. Um, and therefore, we now no longer treat low grade abnormalities and we really need a good reason um, to treat young women, that is proven high grade disease before we offer them ablations or excisions. I, as I said, used two instruments to, macula, to maximize trans transformation zone sampling. And um, we are looking for abnormal dysplastic cells, not cancer in the vast majority of cases. We only treat high grade abnormalities or offer excisional, um, uh, offer diagnostic excisions for women where there's a high risk that there may be a high grade abnormality, um, of which we cannot be certain of. And uh, I would ask, if possible, that all women who are in the perimenopause or postmenopausal are given vaginal estrogens to use routinely for four to six weeks um, before they come to colposcopy. And in fact, there may be a benefit for doing that before they have cervical tests, both in terms of their own comfort, but also in terms of the quality of cytology uh, assessment. Modeling of what would happen to the number of colposcopies was conducted by Karen Canfell and her group in Sydney, who also did the modeling of the 132 different screening algorithms. And this came up with a, a wave formation, which is not, uh, is not unsurprising since you're moving from a less sensitive test at two years to a much more sensitive test at five years. What we have in reality because of the success of vaccination is the lower um, a graph, and we all expected to see an increase in referrals, and indeed we did. We now find ourselves down in the dip. And of course, when we get to 2023, um, sorry, 2022, we will be five years from the initial screen, and we will be offering uh, women who've already had an HPV test their second round of screening. This will eventually uh, oscillate in a dampened fashion, but as you can see, the number of colposcopies that will be required is also reducing because of the power of this test, but mostly because of the power of vaccination. What we saw uh, at the women's was really uh, quite uh, dramatic. Referrals went up from just under two and a half thousand in 2016-17 to over 4,000 in 2018-2019, and the number of colposcopies and treatments also very significantly increased. We saw a small increase in the numbers of cancers, mostly at very early stage, as would be expected when you start using a more sensitive screening test. We've looked at our data and recently published this in the uh, Journal of the uh, Australian New Zealand College. And we've got data from our, all of our colposcopies from the 1st of December 2017 to the 30th of June last year, nearly four and a half thousand women. Interestingly, type 16 and 18 still represented 42% of the total. Um, and uh, the amount of high grade disease uh, was almost exactly correlating with what our cytologists told us. And 10% uh, of histological CIN2, including six cancers, was found when the reflex cytology was negative. So that's telling us how powerful HPV screening is and how insensitive cytology is. Of the non-1618 positive women, uh, the rates of uh, high-grade uh, disease were less with each cytological category. And in fact, uh, with low-grade or better, um, women referred after two positive tests with non-1618 positive HPV had only 10% um, of them had CIN2+. 
of women with a type three transformation zone and no evidence of high grade disease on reflex cytology, a very small number, uh, less than uh, two and a half percent actually had CIN2 or worse. Our colposcopic positive predictive value across um, 15 colposcopies to work in the unit was really very high at 17, 70%. But more important than this, we know we, because of the, the protocols we use in relation to how we repeat cytology and take biopsies, we were not missing much of the high grade disease um, that was not picked up by the first cytology test. Um, follow up after treatment is, as you know, annual co tests until there are two consecutive tests with no HPV and normal cells. We've seen that extending the uh, follow up intervals to a year and two years has actually resulted in increased rates of failure to attend or do not attend uh, to our clinics. Um, and that gives us some concern that we may be missing uh, women uh, who have persistent disease. Uh, the uh, UK uh, actually does its uh, follow up at six and 18 months, and there is some arguments for changing. Colposcopy is completely changed. This is what we used to see all the time with HPV-16. Lots of very clear acetowhite, a large lesion over four quadrants of the cervix, very coarse vascular changes, and it was very clearly IRD negative. When using a scoring system, this came up 10, absolutely barn door CIN3. With the non-1618 lesions, we're tending to see smaller lesions that are paler and um, with fine vascular changes. Iodine staining can be variegated. It looks low grade, but when you biopsy this, a significant amount of it actually is returned by our histologists as being CIN 2 to 3. The useful part of this information is knowing that we need to take more biopsies to accurately predict what we're dealing with. Another major problem, of course, remains the management of older women who have a transformation zone that has retreated into the endocervical canal. You can see a lot of minor acetowhite change here. You cannot see the upper limit of the lesion. What should you do? Well, we tend to do repeat cytology, again, very importantly, using a brush. Um, we can do endocervical curettes, but there is a lot of uh, um, uh, papers that show this is a relatively insensitive test except for the French, who clearly are using endocervical curettes made from Gillette razors. Um, the problem here is when should we treat? When should we intervene for these women? And I tend to be very uh, conservative until we have a clear indication that there is a high-grade abnormality on cytology or biopsy. We also have the benefits from VCS of using an adjunctive test called dual stain, which looks for cellular proteins that indicate possible high-grade changes. Um, and then we would offer these women diagnostic excisions. I've heard of quite a lot of cases recently where uh, women have been offered cone biopsies for the presence of HPV uh, with low grade or normal cytology. That has not shown any high grade dysplasia. They've come back, been found to still have HPV, been offered hysterectomies. And after the hysterectomy have come back, they've been found to have HPV at the top of the vagina, at which point they are referred to an expert colposcopist to deal with the problem. So I have tried very hard to inform younger colleagues performing uh, um, colposcopy that they really should not treat these women unless they're very confident about what they're doing and also have advised them very clearly of the limitations of treatment and the possibility of persistence of HPV. Many of these older women have actually had completely normal screening histories and they may be carrying a very low level of HPV for decades, or they may have had HPV in their 20s or 30s that has remained latent and then reappeared subsequently. Um, they are very concerned and anxious about the virus and where it's come from. Uh, it takes quite a lot of counselling um, and reassurance for them to, to uh, understand that this does not necessarily impact on their, relation, on their current relationships. So there are some solutions to the problems we have. One of them was to alter the way in which we refer women with non-1618 infections. We looked at 1,500 women in our own group and found that if they had normal cytology, there was 5% risk of CIN2+. If they had possible low-grade or low-grade, it was just over 10%. 
when this was then checked with the National Cancer Screening Register, similar figures were found. And in tens of thousands of cases, only one early cancer was found. This led to the recent change in the guidance, which I'll go through uh, in a moment, that has now said women with uh, uh, non-1618 HPV have to have three tests over two years before they get referred to colposcopy if the reflex cytology is low grade or better. For HPV 16 and 18, I advocate biopsying across the transformation zone, even if the, the TZ looks completely, transformation looks completely normal. Um, the reports from America suggest that routine multiple biopsies in such cases results in a pickup of high grade disease at 20%. In our experience, it's been 10%, but it's certainly significant. We use repeat cytology for older women with type three transformation zones. And again, there's a huge benefit if they've had local estrogen before they come for an examination and that we use the dual stain adjunctive tests. And indeed, there may be more adjunctive tests coming uh, on stream and being studied and um, perhaps also um, HPV mRNA tests uh, to determine which women should be offered treatment. Avoid treating HPV is a, a mantra I give to any training colposcopist or young consultant and can find direct evidence or at least significant suspicion for high grade dysplasia before you start excising women's cervixes. We have a routine to review all possible high grade cytology at a multidisciplinary meeting, which we call a concordance meeting. And we've recently published um, our report on that again in uh, the Australian New Zealand College Journal, giving a protocol for how other groups might work. And the guidelines themselves advocate that private practitioners performing colposcopy or confronted with these kinds of problems should speak to their cytologists and ask for review um, of the slides uh, to give some kind of uh, more subjective uh, analysis of, of how high a risk of high grade abnormalities uh, the cytology represents. I want to advocate bringing follow-up to six and 18 months for a number of reasons, uh, but mostly because of, of the risk of women not undertaking proper follow-up after treatment. Treatments are highly successful. In our hands, we know that 95% have normal uh, cytological findings um, at one year, but 3.5% um, have low-grade changes and 1.5% have persistent high-grade, and we really need to identify those women. This is the new algorithm. So for HPV 16 and 18, it hasn't changed. For a negative test, it hasn't changed. But here for non-1618, there are three rounds of screening if cytology is low grade or better. But on a third positive test or on a test separated by two years, they come to colposcopy. Obviously, any non-1618 test that's positive that has a reflex cytology for possible high grade or worse goes straight to colposcopy. This is um, a saving for colposcopy and clinics without significant risk for women. And the studies looking over tens of thousands of women at the National Register give us confidence that this change is a good one. Um, we will refine it looking at individual HPV types and also at not negative possible low grade and low grade categories to make sure uh, that, that this conforms to the level of safety we want. I talked briefly about self-collection. Uh, what we've got here is a very, very powerful tool. You may be aware that in principle, the Medical Standing Advisory Committee has said it is um, uh, in favor of self-collection um, being widened beyond the never screened and uh, screen defaulted group of women. And this could be a very powerful way of getting screening into remote and rural areas, to disadvantaged areas, and to women who find it difficult to engage with the standard screening program. This test is absolutely up in the top left-hand corner of the sensitivity specificity curve. You really don't see tests that are this good very frequently. Lots of companies have devised all kinds of fancy, expensive uh, um, uh, gadgets to collect mucus and cells uh, from the cervix. We have found that all you need is a flocked swab and it's cheap and simple and more comfortable. So we undertook a study with VCS at the Royal Women's of 300 women. 
they collected a sample in the toilets. They then came in uh, to see us and the practitioner who was doing the colposcopy collected another sample uh, with the broom and brush into thin prep. Um, we then compared these two groups and what we found was really very high kappa scores on the right here and really a very good correlation, particularly for 16 and 18. Obviously, a woman who has a positive self-test needs to come and see a practitioner for a practitioner collected cytology sample before they're referred to colposcopy. Um, but it, when we've looked at um, uh, engagement um, with the screening program after a positive self-test, that is a very high level, as was demonstrated by the IPAP trial that was published a couple of years ago. There's a very high participation rate. It's easier, takes the fear out of it. You're not going to hurt yourself. Uh, one of the comments that's made, 91.6% completed follow-up testing within 100 days of the self-collection. And another woman commented, I felt it would be really intrusive for another person. I just didn't want to do it with another person in the room, you know. I wanted to do it with a cotton bud because I could do it myself and it didn't make me feel powerless. So we can overcome a lot of, of the barriers to screening by implementing self-testing. This is coming in the next couple of years. It's probably going to need to another flood of colposcopic referrals. But that, of course, will help us to further reduce the incidence of invasive disease. So... This is more modeling um, from the C4 group. And this is the predictive impact of HPV vaccination and, and uh, HPV screening uh, on cervical cancer in Australia. And what you will see, of course, is an increase in cancer incidence because you're using a more sensitive test and then it will begin to fall. And it will fall to levels that have never been seen anywhere in the world before. Mortality will fall. Um, and this graph will be reflective of the new interventions of, of, of um, uh, uh, screening and vaccination uh, and is not um, uh, controlled for improved treatment. So what about the rest of the world? So just within the last year, the WHO Director General has called for all countries to take action to help end the suffering caused by cervix cancer. WHO's enormous success in reducing mortality, uh, perinatal mortality across the globe, means that cervix cancer is now the biggest killer of women of reproductive years uh, in the whole world. It's a disease of inequality. Where we can't do screening, where there isn't money for care, that's where you find cervix cancer. That's true in Australia itself, as well as in poorer countries that are our neighbours or in Africa or Latin America. This graph needs no real explanation. The darker the color, the more cervix cancer. Sub-Saharan Africa, it's a real problem, compounded by HIV, which has been uh, poorly treated in many, for many years. Um, South, Southern Asia, Southeast Asia, but I would point to you particularly Papua New Guinea have a dreadful burden of disease. And then also in Latin America, East Europe and Kazakhstan. The global perspective is that without intervention, there would be 44 million cases of cervix cancer globally between now and 2070. And most of that would occur in low and medium uh, uh, income countries. Rapid scale up of vaccination, aiming for 80 to 100% coverage could avert uh, up to uh, seven and a half million cases. Screening with two HPV tests in low income countries could avert another 12 and a half to 13 and a half million cases. And the widespread combination of vaccination and screening could reduce incidence by the end of the century to the effect that it's eliminated in high, very high income countries, uh, very close to the elimination threshold in high income countries, and very significantly reduced in medium and low income countries. The 14 per 100,000 uh, in low income countries is actually less than the current rate for cervix cancer in Japan, where rather extraordinarily, there is no organized national screening program and the recommendation for HPV um, vaccination was withdrawn after a vociferous campaign by a group of anti-vaxxers who managed to get hold 
of Mr. Abe's wife when he was still prime minister, a tragedy that is completely avoidable in one of the richest countries in the world. Um, this is Kate Sims modeling of what would happen if we do nothing and if we get it right. So there's lots of different assumptions in the different colored parts of this graph, but it's of no, uh, it's, it doesn't take much imagination to see that the top line is what's going to happen if we do nothing. And you could be looking at uh, 1.8 million cases of cervix cancer a year by the end of the century if we don't grasp this metal. The very best we could manage is probably unachievable, which is the dark green, but the light green is realistic. And that is 80 to 100% uh, coverage with vaccine and two screenings per lifetime. And we actually don't need very um, lab-based technology to do this. There now are point of care HPV tests that can be moved uh, into the community and into remote areas so that screening and vaccination can be combined the screening older women while we vaccinate their daughters. There is now a global strategy. Uh, this uh, is consequent to a resolution that was passed by WHO uh, General Assembly that was proposed by several countries, including a, um, an Australian um, participation. And the aim is to have 90% of girls fully vaccinated with the HPV vaccine by the age of 15. 70% of women are to be screened with a high provision test at 35 and 45, and that also we should not forget, given the burden of invasive disease, 90% of women with, invaded, with, with identified cervical cancer uh, should receive treatment and care, and that includes palliative uh, treatment and pain relief. And this was adopted a year ago by uh, the World Health Assembly. As you can imagine, it has been very significantly impacted upon by the pandemic, uh, but work moves ahead in relation to this. Here's where global vaccination began. And you can see it was actually in rich countries that had screening. And over the years, it spread to other places. And now Latin America is doing exceptionally well. Um, and parts of Africa are doing incredibly well. Um, Rwanda has achieved rates of vaccination of over 80%, mostly on the uh, uh, input of a single uh, woman gynecologist convincing the government of its importance. Bhutan had received 90% plus vaccination of its young women because the dowager queen of the country insisted that everybody should do it and apparently no one uh, disobeys her at all. Um, the, the, the impact of vaccination in Latin America is very important, given what you saw on the previous map of the incidence of disease there. And there is work to be done in Eastern Europe, and particularly in some Islamic countries where cervical cancer is said to not exist. Um, but I have spoken to doctors from those countries, and what there is there, unfortunately, is um, not an absence of cervical cancer, but a denial of its reality. In Australia, we also need to think about equity. Lisa Wop um, is an associate professor at the National Centre for Epidemiology and um, Population Health uh, and proud Indigenous woman who is seeking to make sure that in the, in, in the attempt to eliminate cervix cancer in Australia, uh, we should make sure that the gap is closed and that this disease, which is much commoner, in women of Aboriginal or Torres Strait Island um, descent uh, benefit from these modern uh, developments uh, and the downward pressure on, on invasive disease. So Australia is a world leader in cervical cancer screening, prevention and treatment. Um, in 2020, WHO moved towards the global elimination of cervix cancer. Australia is only the second country in the world to have moved to primary HPV testing. And this has produced significant challenges for colposcopists, but enormous benefits in terms of the numbers of women identified who we can um, treat before they develop invasive disease. We're also the only country um, doing it in a really very extensively vaccinated population. And the COMPASS trial will, in the coming uh, 12 to 18 months, 
uh, be the first trial um, looking at, uh, at HPV uh, screening against liquid-based cytology in a highly vaccinated population. That will be very useful information uh, for the coming uh, decades. Self-collection of HPV DNA is a tool to drive equity and disadvantage and under screen groups and is shortly to be extended um, um, much more widely uh, than uh, was initially allowed in 2017. And the changes to the screening program, including self-tested um, together with, with, with vaccination programs should see Australia one of the first countries to reach the elimination targets, possibly even before I reach retirement. So we have the ability and I would say the duty to work in partnership with colleagues throughout the Indo-Pacific region to extend the vision of cervical cancer elimination for the benefit of all women. And at C4, we are undertaking this with studies that are already going on in PNG uh, and Cambodia and Myanmar, and also uh, extending work into Oceania, uh, both in uh, teaching in Fiji and hopefully a vaccination and HPV testing regime in Samoa. I want to acknowledge this extraordinary group of people um, who contribute both through laboratory work, epidemiology, um, uh, clinical work, data collection and research uh, into what I've been able to present to you and have contributed enormously uh, to the success of these programs in Australia. And here are some relative links to some of the things I've been talking about, um, which will be available to you on a PDF version of this presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm, I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, David. You did a wonderful job of giving us the background um, of cervical cancer in Australia and internationally and the reasoning behind the initial cervical screening program, pap smear program, and then changing over the cervical screening program and the more recent updates. There was just one question and I actually think you answered it because it was fairly early on asking for an explanation for the algorithm relating to HPV other so non-1618 on consecutive yearly tests with normal histology but I think subsequent to that you went on and talked through the slide very well so um, I suspect that one's been answered and other than that both you and Orla did such comprehensive presentations that we don't have any other questions so thank you again for your time and for getting up your Tuesday night to us. Thank you very much and thank you everyone who's attended for, for listening and bearing with us right through to uh, 8.35 and we wish you all a pleasant evening um, and uh, we're happy to help in any way uh, should you have any um, uh, other questions or, or clinical concerns. Um, yeah, I, I was just going to um, add to that as well and um, I don't know how many of you know on the, this um, meeting but uh, David and I are a husband and wife team. Um, so when we were recruited by Michael Quinn over 10 years ago, they knew they were getting a two for one deal. Um, and it's been our pleasure to be here um, in that time. And um, as David said, if, if um, either of us can help in any way, please feel free to email us or pick up the phone at any time. Very happy to, to chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Ola. Thanks, David. Um, so just a couple of other people to say thank you to as well. The Northwestern Primary Health Network, who provided the online platform for this evening, so particularly Hamish and Marie, who have also given up their Tuesday night to assist us. And also to Busby, who I think since disappeared, but she works at the GP liaison unit and she is responsible for most of the organising of this evening. So thank